everybody, it's Romania Black, and I wore this shirt tonight because I have a feeling we're gonna need it. <laughs> we're on episode 32 of Monster, and I, I'm glad that the last episode was, as somber as it was, a slight breath of relief, because episodes 29 and 30 were roller coasters, and then 31 was kind of like, okay, calm down, we're only 31 episodes in, <laughs> we're not even to the halfway point. But I am really concerned because Tenma is acquiring a sniper rifle to go after Johan, seemingly at this festival where there's going to be people around. It's going to be a spectacle. Lots of people potentially can see Tenma with the sniper rifle. That seems problematic, right? Because Lungay is getting the police involved as we speak. So you have a festival with lots of people. You have Tenma possibly being able to be seen with a sniper rifle shooting at Johan, which is all Lungay needs to be like, look, proof, Tim is a killer, go after him. So it's very, very concerning, right? And Dieter's been crying. I don't like seeing Dieter crying. Anytime Dieter's crying, I'm like, stop. <laughs> Quit making the boy cry. Because he doesn't want Tim to become a murderer. But we have lots of comments and I want to talk about them before we get started with this episode. Um, the first one is kind of a very interesting point that Maya B noted in the Discord. We were talking about episode 31. And that's the idea of a lot of the discussion in the comments have been about Richard's state. Was he drunk when he shot Stephen? What was he doing? Was it premeditated? Because Johan seems to suggest that Richard, it was an execution, right? Which is very troubling when you compare it to Tinma right now because Tinma is essentially going to try and execute Johan right? It's it's literally an execution is what he's planning. But I did want to point out what Maya B said in the Discord, talking about R whenever Richard has a PTSD moment, whenever he would have one involving Stephen, the youth that he shot, every time he envisioned him, it showed Stephen pointing a gun at him. Now you can look at that either two ways. Either one, he was always anticipating Stephen going to attack him and and shot before he could get to that point. He was like, he saw Steven as being a threat and was like, I'm gonna shoot him. And, and him pointing the gun at him in all of his moments and visions is a symbolic gesture. So it's either figurative and it's symbolic and it shows Richard viewed him as a threat and thus thought he needed to kill him, kind of where Timma is at right now with Johan, or it's a fact of the matter that Richard shot him in self-defense. That whenever he cornered Steven, Steven raised the gun and Richard's like, I'm gonna beat you to it. And he shot him before Richard, before Stephen could shoot him back. Now, if the latter is the case, that kind of goes a little bit against Johann's execution narrative because it wasn't the fact that Richard just killed him because he thought he was evil. It's the fact that you tried to kill me. I, to defend myself, I shot at you. Whether it was reflex, whatever. And then Richard felt awful about it later because he knew that he shouldn't have shot him. But it was just a self-defense thing. Either way... Either scenario can kind of have the potential to change up the narrative that Johan wants to present. The thing of it is, Tenma's going after Johan now. It's not self-defense. Tenma is premeditating. He is planning on doing it. And my fear is he's going to do it at a festival where there's all these people around that could potentially see him with a gun. And that's all Lungay needs at this point. Lungay just needs a reason to go after Tenma and get him arrested. More than suspicion. And if Tenma is seen on a roof with, roof with a sniper rifle or in a room with a sniper rifle, whatever. I say roof because I feel like the show is going to make callbacks to Rosso's character with Nina, and he was on top of a roof with a sniper rifle, so it would make sense narratively if you're gonna make that symbolic loop to have Tinma on the roof, but a hot Tinma on the roof. <laughs> a cat on a hot Tinma roof, oh my God. But yeah, I'm worried because you're gonna be at a festival with lots of people. There's a lot of potential for witnesses which is the last thing Tenma needs. The thing that has benefited Johan the most is that he acts from the shadows, either in the darkness or in secluded areas where there are not a lot of witnesses who can pinpoint you doing things. And Tenma is not seemingly thinking about that. But, at the, but then again, at this point, Tenma doesn't care. He just wants to shoot Johan and get it over with. He doesn't even care what happens afterwards. So that's a, it's a big old mess, right? But thank you, Maya B, for that. And speaking of Richard, Alex Johnson was talking about like whether or not Richard was drunk when he shot the boy. And that's part of Johan's big narrative. Johan's big crux in his argument to Richard is the fact of whether or not he was drunk or sober when he killed Stephen. I honestly don't care so much about that because for me, what matters with Richard's character, regardless of however Johan wants to paint it, 
what matters to me is what Richard does afterwards. Like after Stephen's death, what does he do? And the thing of it is he tries to atone and move forward, right? He tries to atone and move forward. And that's kind of interesting because you can compare that to Mueller, right? You Mueller and Musser killed Nina's foster parents. Mueller, instead of atoning and taking responsibility for his actions and trying to move forward and get better, Mueller ran away. He ran away from the conflict and the guilt and the problems and got himself a nice little life. And we saw how that ended for him. Did, it basically ended about the same way as Richard. They both, one ran away, one tried to atone, and both of them led to their downfall because they were tied to Johan. So, but the idea of how Richard handles it afterwards, I really want to talk about in comparison to Omaru's comment, which the thing of it is Richard was trying to atone and that ends up getting him killed. Omaru had a really good comment on YouTube about how he killed Steven without confirming, like Johan said, without confirming his crimes. He just did it because he felt a true evil come from him, which we know now Steven was also from Kinderheim. Can't imagine any connections there. So he felt this true evil, and before he could confirm any of his crimes or have proof, he killed him. Then you have him talking to Johan and he seems to have doubts about Johan and maybe he senses the same true evil that he sensed in Steven. But the difference is because he's atoning and he's trying to move forward and become a better person, he doesn't instantly go with his gut instinct and instead tries to give Johan the benefit of the doubt and it kills him. And I'm like, ah, oh. and so now you have the situation with Tinma and Johan where is Tinma going to doubt and try to give Johan a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. It's going to lead to him like slipping through Tenma's fingers. Or is he going to act? What are we going to do? I I can't see Tenma killing Johan this early in the game. We're only 32 episodes in. It's a 74, 75 episode series. There's no way. Right? So I, mm, I don't know. But I thought that was a really, really good comment, Omaru. Really good comment. Um, Gaia talks about how uh, Richard was thrown off by Johan's laid back attitude. And I agree with that. Johan's laid back attitude kind of threw him off because it's not exactly what, I feel like it throws a lot of people off because it's not what they're expecting when they meet Johan, right? And then uh, Sack talked about how, um, it's not Robert, It's not Ricardo, it's Roberto. I realize I've been saying Ricardo um, a lot in these reactions and so I apologize, it's Roberto. I think all the R's have been throwing me off. We have Reichwein, we have Richard, we have Roberto. There are too many R's. <laughs> Take them away. So Roberto, I will try my best. I'm usually the worst with names. Great with faces, awful with names. So I will try my best to make sure it's Roberto. Roberto, not Ricardo, Roberto. But if I say Ricardo, please know that I mean Roberto. <laughs> And then, yeah, but the really interesting thing is that Johan seems fixated on the sin. He seems fixated on the evil that has been done, which is so curious because you get this evil that emanates from Johan and yet he's fixated on it with others. It's fascinating. It, it reminds me a lot about, we were talking in the comments about Light Yagami from Death Note in that, you know, Light, a lot of people said he had this evil within him, kind of like Johan, but Light was very judgmental and he judged people on their actions like that. And it seems like Johan may be the same way. Only Johan plays a pretty long game. Pretty long game, right? It's kind of fascinating. But yeah, so that's, um, those are my comments. I, I'm really excited, y'all, to see what will end up happening. I hope you all are too. But we're not going to waste much more time. I just want to give a quick shout out over to Patreon to thank the patrons who've been supporting my channel. I have three tiers up on Patreon. You can go check it out. But the philanthropy tier, which is the highest tier, get a special shout out in some of my videos, as well as get to break ties um, if we have any ties in the polls. And they get all the benefits of the other tiers as well. So I wanted to give a quick shout out to those who help support the channel and help me do the things that I love to do, which is talk about Monster, right? With you all and you guys are, are kind enough to listen to my ramblings. So in any case, I want to give a shout out to Edgar, to Dana, to Anime Annie, to Nameless Monster, to Tyrone Tyrone, to Shimoyama, to Be Happy, to Translucent Men, to Eric, to Sunspots, and to Alex Cornejo. You all are amazing. And I greatly, greatly appreciate your support. All of my love. So yeah, 
it's been about 10 minutes. I think uh, it's time that we start this uh, start this party and see what happens. So we are going to start episode 32 of Monster. And we're going to do that here in three, two, one. And I'll see y'all on the other side. Well, <laughs> this was a rather interesting uh, episode. It definitely felt like it felt like there were two chapters in the manga, and these chapters were setting up. They're they're setting up things to come, right? They're setting up things to come. It's setting up where Nina is. She's in Munich. She's at the university. She's catching up with Tenma. I I have lots of theories and things. This is all gonna come to a head, right? This is all this is all gonna come to a head at some point and and uh, so th there's a lots of possibilities with Nina here now because she's in Munich but it felt like two chapters of the manga and the anime studio was like neither chapter is long enough to make its own episode so the manga studio was like we're just gonna the anime studio said we're just gonna put them together in an episode split them in half and just call it good and it actually surprisingly works it surprisingly works because Nina and Tenma are kind of our crux with with Johan, right? They're kind of our crux with everything. So what's interesting in all of this is that Tinma, Tinma is just going through the ringer because it, he's not, that's not the type of person he is. He's not a killer, right? And it's like every every fiber of his being does not want to be a killer. Every fiber of his being wants to be the one with the bird on his shoulder. And we'll talk about that at the end of the episode. But every ounce of his being does not want to be a killer. And he's trying to force himself to be something that he's not. Because he thinks it's the thing that he has to do. And it's like, Tinma, no, you don't. There, It's just, no, this is not going to end well. None of this is going to end well. I was like, no. Because if we look at the scenario, we have Lunge gathering the police of Munich to be on alert for someone that's going after Johan. He has a picture of Johan. He knows what Johan looks like. Is he going to, is Lunge going to confront Johan and find out who he is really? No. He's going to see Johan and know that Tinma's going after him and is like, if I just stick around this guy, I'll catch him in the act. And it's like, Lunge, no. It's like you have the opportunity to find out who Johan really is and that he's the killer behind all of this if you use your detective skills, but he wants to prove himself right. So it's like, so there's that. The only thing I can think of that could possibly be in Tima's favor is the fact that Nina is there. That Nina might be able to stop him because she's heard the Rosa story. She knows all about the taste of sugar. Tima is trying so hard to forget the taste of sugar. And I'm like, girl, girl, you need to get to him and help him remember <laughs> because he needs it so badly. Like I need Nina to be there to help him, right? We'll talk about the whole, the, the forest is the sanctuary, right? But, and it's, it's kind of a two layered episode because you have the forest being the sanctuary, but also Nina kind of becomes a sanctuary for Lottie who connects the dots and realizes she looks like Johan. I was so mad that she didn't mention Johan and Nina. I'm like, that's who she's looking for. Girl, girl, you missed the opportunity. But man, this episode, this episode, I, I feel for Lottie. I do. I kept getting... I, I've said that we got like Tinma vibes with Carl because Carl is not totally like Tinma, but he kind of has a similar look and a, a kindness to him that Tinma has. But he gets caught up in things, right? And Lottie, Lottie has always given me, since the moment we met her, right, has always given me a slight Eva vibe to her. It's not nearly to the crazy extent that Eva is. But there's something there that's similar, right? There, there's a little bit of a passion and a jealousy there that Eva has, that Lottie has as well, right? Which part of Monster's theme is that we are all, you know, all of us have the potential to be jealous, have the potential to be killers, have the potential to do this. But Lottie, I feel for her, right? Because she's just, you know, trying to be nice to Carl, being like, oh, do you have some time? And he says, he says not really, what is it? I'm like, Carl, be nice to her. Like, she's just trying to be a, a good person and being kind to you. And she says, oh, well, I was going to see if you'd like to get some tea and talk about Mr. Schubert. You know, about the guy that I helped you figure out things about. And he's like, oh, I don't care about that anymore. And she's like, he's like, I'm sorry, I'm in a bit of a hurry. 
there's a meeting my dad needs to chair. She's like, see ya. Because it's like, I, I feel her pain because she's like, we, we did all this, you know, to find out information about this one thing. And now that he's gotten what he's always wanted, he doesn't care about any of that other stuff. And Lottie's kind of like, but it's still suspicious. But all these things. And Carl's like, but I've gotten what I wanted. So why would I need that anymore? And Lottie's just like, you're, you're missing the big picture. So I feel for her. I really do. And she clearly likes Carl, as she says. And so it kind of sucks that Carl doesn't reciprocate that to her, right? She was so nice to him and trying to help him. And then he's... And also, I'm sorry, but if he really set Constantine up with her, Carl, come on, man. <laughs> like, you... Did you not see what a terrible idea that is? I was so glad when Nina just drove him to the ground. I was like, hell no. But I feel for Lottie. I do, because... It's like those little simple things. There's like, there's a greed that's there, right? That Carl has kind of got sucked up into only being with his dad and Johan. There's like, like a gluttonous, a greed there. And Lottie's kind of like, but we were doing all this wholesome research and now Carl doesn't have time for it. He's, he's doing, he's helping his dad do all the political things and everything. It's, it's, I feel very bad for her, but it's, it's very sad. And so, and girl, and back in the 90s, I, I've seen those old computers, those Macs. You can't do much with them. <laughs> you're not, you're not streaming anything on those computers at all. Old school tech. I, I feel like some of these series, I love them being set in the 80s and 90s because there is a, there's enough technology to make it fun, but there is definitely a limitation with the technology of that time period where you can only do so much. And so it's kind of fun. Like if it was set in modern day, I don't think this show would, I think the show would be not as long as it <laughs> is right now. But she notices Nina who's researching. And so Lottie, Lottie gets jealous in this moment because Lottie has a lot of insecurities. She feels like Carl doesn't like her because she's not pretty enough. She's like, if I was pretty like Nina, then, then he would like me because I bet if I was pretty like her, I wouldn't have any problems. I could get whatever I wanted to. And I was like, girl, you cannot be further from the truth. Nina has gone through. And what I like about Nina's character, because I love Nina a lot in this show, is Nina never, she never like goes on a tangent about her own problems. She senses that Lottie has insecurities and she's projecting them onto Nina. And she understands that Nina talking about all of her problems isn't going to help Lottie. I, as somebody that does mediation and did mediation for my own, for my own, you know, graduate school, I, there's a big, a big part of that of trying to help someone who clearly is going through stress and anxiety and issues. A big part of it is that sometimes they just need someone to listen to them and they don't need you to respond. That's like a big thing. Sometimes some people just need you to listen to their problems, let them vent it, let, let them get it out of their system, but they don't expect you to have an answer or a reply. They just need you to sit there and listen to them, let them deal their problems out, and then they'll feel much better. And I feel that's what Nina does for Lottie, and it's so great because Nina could very well have been like, well, sucks to be you not getting like to go to the dance with the guy you like, but... My parents were killed possibly by my twin brother who's, you know, on a murder spree and I'm trying to find him before another friend of mine kills him. So, you know, Nina could have one-upped Lottie in like two seconds, but because Nina's such a good person, she doesn't do that. Instead, she just lets Lottie vent her problems. She listens to her and then she says, hey, it's going to be okay. We're going to make it better. It's going to be all right. She doesn't try to push her own things onto Lottie because that's not going to help Lottie. One-upping her is not going to help, right? So... I, I give major props to Nina for that, but I feel for Lottie because it's very human to be jealous. It's very human to be envious, right? And also I want Lottie's purple top <laughs> with the lace. It's very cute. So yeah, but she sees Nina and I, I just, God, the only part of this episode was I wish that Lottie had, I wish Lottie had talked to Nina and gotten to her about Johan. I wish she had, but... In the long run, if that had been the case, I feel like Nina would have felt bad because that would have made Lottie an involved person in all of this, which would have put Lottie in danger. Because people that get associated with t with Johan tend to die. The only exception right now is Schubert and Carl because I believe 
that Johan wants something from Schubert and he needs Carl to stay alive to have that happen. So that's the only reason Carl and Schubert are alive at this point. That That is the only reason. And so, and then, yeah, Carl's like, oh, I can't go. There's a state Congress dinner meeting. And he's like, it's really important. I'm sure you'll have no problem finding a date for the dance. And she's like, oh, well, ha, ha, ha. And then she goes back to pressing the five button. I don't know if there's a significance to the five button, except the only thing I can think is that it is in the middle. It's the crossroads of all the arrows. So she's just stuck in the middle. She doesn't know which way to go with her emotions. That's the only symbolic thing I can get at. I also love that they, they get around copyright by saying mech instead of Mac, which is fun. And then, so, Nina has been looking up information about Margot Langer just like everybody else. Everybody has been researching this whole thing. Nina's getting up to date on her info. lungi has been getting up to date on his info. Timma through Reichwein's been getting up to date. Lottie knows all the things. Carl has kind of given up on researching because he's gotten what he wanted. And so I, but I'm glad that Nina is up to speed and figuring out what's been going on, right? Because she's trying to find Johan and figure out where he is. And so then they go and they trade notes and she's also been looking into the unsolved murders in the Bayern area for the last four years. So Nina is trying to track all this info back to Johan to see if she can find anything. What's so fascinating about Nina is now that we've spent some time with Johan and gotten to be around him more, there are quite a few similarities between Johan and Nina. They both have this like soft cadence to their voice that's very alluring. They're both both beautiful. Um, but there's, what's interesting is their differences in that Johan is very cold, quiet, and collected. And Nina is very warm and focused. Like they're, they both have an intensity to them, but Johan's intensity is very steely and cold. And Nina's is very warm and fiery. Like she, she, it's like fire and ice. It's a song of fire and ice between Johan and Nina. Where Johan, he does things from the shadows in, it, that's another thing too. He does things from the shadows and he's very cold and calculated. But Nina, she's, she, again, last episode was called In Broad Daylight. Nina's out here like gathering her research. She's just out doing her thing, interacting with people, making connections. Whereas Johan, Johan only makes connections if they are necessary to his agenda. Nina is like, becomes friends with anybody. And whether or not it benefits her agenda or not, is whatever like this just so happened to work in her favor because they were you know influenced they were trying to find the same people but like with Rosso for example where I guess Rosso she was trying to figure out how to shoot from Rosso so I guess there was some involvement there but yeah Nina and Johan they just they have similarities but they also have differences to their characters too and it's kind of interesting to see how they are the same and different in this but they're both smart. Like, you can't say Nina is not smart. She's good. Girl has done her research. She has been gathering up the cookies to, like, try to figure out what her brother is doing. So, I God, I wish that Lottie, when she was talking about Carl getting reunited, mentioned Johan. Because she says she's 100% sure Carl's not involved in all of the other cases surrounding Schubert. And Nina's like, well, I wonder, I just... It was like you're one line away. All needed to be like, well, I wonder if anybody helped, you know, is helping Carl and Schubert as well. And Lottie would have been like, oh, Johan. And it would have been like, da. But there wasn't that bridge moment. So I'm wondering if at some point, because I don't think that Tim is going to shoot Johan in the forest. I don't think that's going to happen. But I wonder if at some point Johan is going to be in Tim's sights and that's when Nina's going to show up and Johan's not going to be able to shoot him because he's going to be like, shit, Nina's here. I, I don't know. Oh, we're going to talk about Tim's story and this side of things, but I, I just don't know. And so I, Lottie points out that Nina is really into this college report. She's like, I'm looking for someone. And that's when Lottie asks her, does a person like you ever have to worry about anything? Everything goes how you want because you're as pretty as you are, doesn't it? And I'm like, no, it's not the case. And Nina's like, well, what are you trying to say? And she says, you probably have no love problems at all. And that's, I think that's what stops Nina. I think Nina was going to get like maybe a little offended there being like, what are you talking about? And then she says the thing about the love problems. And Nina's like, oh, you're just projecting your insecurity in this moment. Gotcha. Because she was, as someone pointed out, 
Nina and Johan are both law majors, which is crazy of all crazies. But I also thought Nina was also looking into psychology. Was that not a thing? I feel like that was a thing. So she kind of knows what this is, right? And again, Nina just listens to her. She just listens. And then they go to the dance, which what a 90s dance party. You got the disco ball with the multicolored lights. Everybody's horrible at dancing. <laughs> it's the ultimate Caucasian dance party. I'm like, oh my God, not enough food, too much liquor, and no one knows how to dance. <laughs> it's the ultimate white party. <laughs> yeah. And I love Nina's like, I don't normally go to dances like this. And Lottie's like, everybody's looking at you. And Nina's like, that's not exactly a good thing. Nina's like, I dressed up as a prostitute once. So <laughs> I'm not sure if I want all this attention. Right. And she's like, Lottie, I don't want all this. And that's when Constantine shows up. And of course, he's like, I'm from the Supernatural Phenomenon Research Group. And she's like, oh my, a weird one's come over. I love Lottie's face, but she's like, eh. And Nina's face too is like, eh. I love Nina's face. Nina's expression is like trying to be polite when you're like, I don't want to know. It's like if you go to a bar and a guy you are not interested in at all, like slides a drink over and he's like, this one's for you. And you're like, thanks. It's like, I'm good, but thanks. You know, you know, it's just like, you're just trying to be nice. You're like, I, I always feel that way when I go out with friends. I was like, we're just trying to sit here and have a good time. If, if we are interested, we will come to you. <laughs> like, like, we'll call you. Don't worry. Just leave us alone. Let us have our, let, let us have our fun, right? But she's like, I can't believe a guy like you, him has the balls to approach you, Nina. Which girl... Kudos for Lottie being a wing woman. I appreciate her in that moment. But then the guy's like, I came for you. But what sucks is he just came to, to Lottie because Carl asked him to. And that's what hurts the most. And he's like, he's not my type. Let's leave together. And again, I love Nina because at first Nina's like, oh, well, good for you, Lottie. You got a partner. And then when she's like, he's not my type, Nina's like, oh, okay, then let's go. Like, good for her. And, you know... At first, I felt kind of bad for Constantine because I was like, that kind of sucks that you got dumped by this girl, instantly rejected. But then when he was forcing himself on her, I was like, dude, you need to go. And then, yeah, we cut to everybody. Everybody's doing the Frankenstein spin sachet, like just the, the, the <laughs> rocking back and forth. It's like every eighth grade middle school dance party. And then we go to them standing in the back. She's like, I don't think we fit in here. And Nina's like, no, I agree. We definitely don't. And she's like, what's with that? Tons of guys have come up to you. And she's like, I haven't been trying to. But then I love that Nina's like, all the students are gathered here having fun. It's been a while since I've done that. Yeah, since she's been around something like this. Because yeah, Nina's been through it. She's been through, like, she's been through, like, a near, a near homicide. Watching a guy get shot. Like, watching a woman get like drowned in a toilet, like nearly being assaulted, being kidnapped. She's gone through a lot of shit. A little college party has been not one of those things. So yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's really sweet to see Nina be like, you know, this is, you know, the not first time she's had something like this happen to her. And Lottie's going to ask her something, but she doesn't finish the sentence. She says, are you? I wonder what she was going to ask. That's interesting. You're just different than you look. Which again, that is so interesting because her and Johan, they are so different than they look, right? Johan on the surface seems like he's not hard, like he's, you know, very, very innocent and pure. And then you've seen him like literally shoot a man in the face. Whereas Nina, she comes across as being kind of this aloof, like airy, you know, pretty girl. But then underneath it all, she's strong and smart and has this really strong sense of conviction and resolve. And she's not as airy as she seems, right? Which I love that about her character. I love it so much. And she's like, what do you mean by that? And then that's when Constantine shows up and he's been drinking. And it's just very uncomfortable. I, I'm i not a fan of this scene and this trope in stories. And when she says, go away, th that is a sign of go away. Like, that's not a, okay, keep going. It's, no, she said, no, leave. So I'm very glad that, I'm very glad that, that Nina, like, put him in a strong arm. And he says, one dance. And he said, Carl asked me to be your partner. 
And that's what hurts Lottie so much is she's like, I liked Carl. And for the guy I liked to try to set me up with you, it's not just the fact of Carl trying to set her up. It's the fact that Carl set her up with trying to set her up with someone who is obviously someone she would not be interested in. I think that's what hurts her the most is the fact that it seems like not only does Carl not like her, he doesn't even really know her. And that really hurts. And I've been there, girl. I've been there in Lottie's shoes. And it sucks. It's like one of the worst feelings. So I am glad that Nina like uses her jujitsu skills. And is like, let's go. The animation on Lottie's face as they walk out is just heartbreaking though. And again, I get a lot of major Eva vibes with Lottie. Because Lottie, it's like when Eva lost Tenma, she like went crazy. And, but Eva didn't have anybody to cry to, right? Eva didn't have a shoulder to cry on and someone to listen to her and tell her it was going to be all right, move forward. She didn't have that. So she kind of fell into this pit of despair. Whereas in Lottie's case, she actually has a shoulder to cry on and lament to and Nina supports her. So I feel like that changes the outcome of things. And it's just, it's such a hard moment, but I'm glad that Nina's there to like listen to her. And he's like, Carl doesn't want anything to do with me now. It's just, it's just my dad this, my dad that. She's like, we spent all this time together. I helped him get reconnected with him. And now I have nothing to show for it. He like has given me no thanks. And then I like that Nina comforts her. She's like, I never thought being this ignored would be painful. And Nina knows that feeling very well too. And she says, it does hurt. It all hurts. But it's all right. Things can't continue to be... Thing, bad things can't continue to happen forever. I'm like, Nina, don't you jinx this. Don't you jinx this series now. You, you, shh, let, let it go. She says we can't let them continue. I, I do like that. I like that she says that bad things can't continue to happen. And at first you're like, so what? Is there going to be a divine intervention? But then Nina says we can't let them continue. Like we have some capacity to, sh to control our lives if bad things are happening, we need to stop them. We can't let them control the rest of our life. And I'm like, Nina, my girl, I freaking love her. And then we see Nina get on the bus. And she and her and Lottie. Now her and Lottie have exchanged information. So at some point, if Lottie remembers something, she may be able to get in contact with Nina. So that's good. Or Nina can get in contact with her if something goes down, right? But the moment that she she smiles. And that smile, it looks like Johan with a wig. Looks just like him. And that's when Lottie realizes who it is. And she's like, oh shit, it is. She looks just like Johan, that girl. So then we go to Tenma. And I, I thought that the Nina and Lottie stuff was the sad part of the episode. Nope. I, it's very telling that Tim is practicing in the rain in the warehouse because the thunder and everything, you can't hear the gun firing. The rain kind of, the rain on the tin roof kind of blocks it out, which is a thing. But it shows Timma being a sight. And I, I hate it because Timma just, he's got the bags under his eyes. He looks so like depressed. And he talks about using a gun that was rejected by the army despite its efficiency. And he says it holds four bullets, but you won't have time to shoot all four. He's like, by the time one goes off, the gun is going to be loud enough and powerful enough that one shot is going to cause a scene and they're going to find you really quickly. So you've got one shot to get this right and then you need to get out of there. Otherwise, it's curtains. So there's that. There's that going on. It's the end for you if you can't do it in one shot. And then Tim is like, I know. So we go to the forest, all right? And I he's using the scope to practice shooting Johan, which is so creepy, right? So creepy in itself. But um so they're so in the forest. So they they go walking through the forest for their for fresh air and everything in their sanctuary, which is a thing in itself. We've talked about how people went bird watching in the forest. The thing about it is, were they really bird watching or were they shooting people? Is this a reference to something else? Because you have like, they talked about people meeting Johan through bird watching and that's how they met, right? But then you had the story about the old man who said he came into the forest and shot someone 
and the birds never came to any more him anymore. But yeah, I wonder if there has to be a connection there, right, to the bird watching and the murders, right? That there's some kind of hidden code or lingo with that. But Tinma looking for Johan. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, y'all. There is Carl pushing Schubert out in front, Johan behind. Johan is keeping next to Carl and Schubert for reasons, right? And he keeps next to the children for reasons. One is that the man back in the warehouse said that the problem with this gun and the bullets is you need to make sure the target is isolated and there's no one in line as well. If anybody gets in the way, it's going to get messy. Johan is making himself be it with all these people anytime he's somewhat of a target for Tinma. When he's out in the park, he's with all the little kids. Tinma's not going to shoot a gun with all those kids there, so that's not going to happen. Out in the forest, Johan is keeping close to Carl and Schubert. Is Tinma going to risk hitting Carl and Schubert with the bullet? So, I mean, Johan's being strategic with it, but okay. The moment he looks through the scope and looks at Johan and sees him and Johan turns and looks directly at the camera, directly at the scope. I feel that was the creepiest thing in the world. And there is no way that he should have been able to see him. He's psychic. He's psychic, damn it. I, I don't want to know if it's true or not. I don't want to be confirmed or deconfirmed. We'll find out when we find out. But there is no way he would look right at the camera at Timma. He knows what Timma's doing. He knows that Timma is getting close to him and he's luring him in. He's going to bait Timma out in the open where he is seen before he can shoot him. I I would almost bet money on it. I just, ooh. I don't want to know if I'm right or not. I want to find out on my own. But, mm, 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 mm. I don't know, y'all. I don't know. Because, and, and somebody in the comments, you know, I'm tr I try to be like, I don't want any comments giving hints or clues because people in the Discord have already given hints or clues that there's psychic stuff going on. And I've been trying to avoid it and trying not to think about it and being like, well, maybe they were wrong. Maybe they were lying. Maybe I misunderstood. But I, and somebody in the comments was like, how would he know all this stuff about Richard that only Richard knew unless he could read his mind? Right? How would he be able to get with Jurgens and know all the things about Jurgens, like about him and his mom, to set him up in the basement in that one episode if he couldn't read his mind? So, I mean, it makes sense, but it's kind of like, and they were talking about doing experiments in Kinderheim, so it makes sense, but I don't want it confirmed or deconfirmed. The show is going to confirm it or deconfirm it at some point, and I want to wait till that happens, but... Why else would he look directly into the scope? That just he knows what Tinma is doing and he is luring Tinma to a place where he can strike or where he's... Or if Tinma does, if Johan doesn't want to strike at Tinma, he's luring him to a place where someone else will strike at him. So, I just, y'all, y'all. It's problematic. But then we see the old man and he says, Are you bird watching? And the question is, he said he saw, he thought that hunt that he was a hunter at first. He thought Timo was a hunter and not a doctor. So when he asks him if he's bird watching, is he hunting? Or is the act of bird watching <clears throat> seeking atonement? Or seeking sanctuary? I don't know. He does bring up we get a lot of visitors every week on Thursday. And he says, especially Carl and Schubert and Johan, which makes me think. Thursday boy, the apocalypse coming, right? Thursday boy. If, if maybe it wasn't the reader on Thursday that was the Thursday boy, maybe it's the boy that visits the forest on Thursday, which is Johan. So I don't know. But the moment, the moment that he confronts Timma, the old man does, he says, I'm apologizing this forest and I have been for 60 years. The moment he says that, I'm like, one, before he even got to the sanctuary metaphor, I was like, Timma, you can't shoot Johan in this forest. That old man snuck up on you out of nowhere. If you walk through with a sniper rifle and somebody sneaks up on you and you aren't paying attention, you're going to get noticed in no time. That's not going to work. But, man, Timma just, he goes through the ringer. And when he's at the restaurant, just sitting there by himself, not eating or drinking anything, he just looks completely disheveled and he's so pale and just hollow inside. And he just leaves the money and goes. Like, he doesn't even eat it. And the woman's like, that's our most famous food. And you, you didn't eat it, you bastard. 
But I, I thought of the whole thing with Rosso and him telling Nina that you can kill somebody if you forget the taste of sugar. And it's almost like Timma is trying to forget everything that brings him possible joy in life so that he can steal himself to kill Johan. Like the food that would be good, the sugar, everything. He's forgetting it so that he can harden himself to be able to kill someone. And it's like, and, but you know he doesn't want to, right? You know he doesn't want to. And so, God, even when he's at the park looking for him, and Johan's, it's like, what is Johan telling the children? What is he out there telling the children? They're all laughing. What is he telling them? We already know he's been encouraging some bad things with these kids. What is he telling the kids? Like, how is he influencing this group? Like, it's just him. I don't, I feel like, I feel like he's like Moriarty from Warrior of the Patriot, and he's like, kill all the rich people, children. <laughs> like, I just feel like it's one of those moments. It's like, what are you saying to them, Johan? And then when he goes down there, and he's right there with them, smiling and laughing with the kids, that, that moment that just freaks Tinma out, and Tinma's like, I can't do it. And he imagines, like, and he imagines his hands start shaking because he imagines pulling the trigger in the park with all those. Could you imagine if he'd shot Johan while he's standing, like, while he's kneeling down for those kids? And then, like, just his brain splatters everywhere and those kids get, like, doused in it. It feels like the music video for Jeremy from Pearl Jam. What? No. Like, and that freaks Tinma out. And I think it's so fascinating that Tinma... Like he clutches his hand like this and his hand is shaking and it's the same hand that Lunge was tapping with in the last episode that he looked at too. That it's the same gesture. I, I love that kind of parallel that the mangaka creates. But it's the idea that this hand could take someone's life. And Tinma has been always someone that saved people's lives with his hands. And here he'd be taking a life. And it's just like... It's so frustrating, and I, I'm like, I don't want Tim. I'm like Dieter. I don't want Timma to do it. And he tries to steal himself, right? He does the anime thing where he, he clenches the fist. He's like, no, I'm going to kill Johan. I've got this. I'm going to do it. And we cut back to him at the apartment where he's trying to do push-ups and trying to steal his resolve and everything and make himself get hardened because that sniper rifle is right there for him to use. But when he goes back to the restaurant, the woman's like, look, I remember every customer's face. If you're not eat the food, at least take the soup home. She's like, you look horrible. And he does. He looks awful. It sucks. I hate it. I hate it for Tenma. I really do. But he eats the soup before he goes back to the forest. And he says, I have to shoot him in this forest. But he just looks so miserable. But then he sees Johan talking with them. And as he walks, he's like, so, he's so, the thing of it is, he throws up, I feel, because he's, like, exhausted from the heat, right? Like, I, I've been outside long enough in the heat before where it's made me nauseous, but it's not only the heat that makes him nauseous, it's the idea that he's gonna, that it's, it's coming. The moment is coming is making him feel absolutely awful. And that, that's when he notices the man up against the tree that fell and hurt his leg. And he's like, I lost my footing after walking in this forest for seven years. And so that you, Tim was like, I didn't do much. I just, you know, healed your leg up. I just did first aid. You need to go to a hospital after this. And that's when he tells the story. When he hears the birds, the birds are gathering here. He says, a long time ago, there was a man and the wild birds would ride on his shoulders and he could call them to him and they would perch on his hand. They'd land on him if he held his hand out. And he's talking about himself, right? When he was a child, he would spend time with the birds in this forest. He's like, but then came the age of Hitler. And it's, it's this really beautiful analogy about, it's this beautiful analogy about a boy who was innocent and kind and the birds would flock to him right because of his kindness and his good soul but then the age of hitler the age of evil came where a month and you know a monster came to the forest and he followed him kind of like johan getting carl to follow him right 
and he belonged to the police force, he believed that the Nazi party would bring prosperity to this country, believing in the values of Hitler, believing just like how Karl believes in Johann, how Schubert believes in him as well, right? But what's interesting is the story is not a perfect parallel to Tinma, not really, because, you know, he talks about he's kind of more in line with, like, he's kind of in a position like Karl, where he really, like Karl and Schubert, where they fully believe in Johann, whereas this man fully believed in Hitler and what he was saying was going to happen. And he says he received orders that a vicious criminal was hiding out in the forest. He knew the forest so well he was sent to chase after the criminal and was ordered to find and kill him. And so that part is kind of like Tinma, where Tinma believes that he has to kill Johan, just like this man believed that he needed to kill the person who was supposedly a criminal, right? So that, that's the connection between him and Tinma. But it says that when he caught him, the man he chased wasn't a criminal at all. He was just an ordinary foreigner. He had no way of knowing beforehand who this person really was. So it's going back to so many different things because it's tying to, it's tying to this part of the story ties a lot to Richard and Stephen, where Richard was ordered to go and track down this criminal. He wasn't ordered to kill him, but because he knew he was a criminal or thought he was a criminal, he killed him. Whereas Johan was arguing that, the, that Stephen wasn't a criminal because he wasn't old enough. He was just a guy in a circumstance. So there's all these connections to Schubert and Carl following Johan, to Tinma thinking that he has to kill Johan, to Richard killing Stephen when maybe he should not have. And there's all these ties to all these situations. But what's fascinating to me is the dialogue about the man that this old man was sent to kill wasn't actually a criminal. I'm like, is the story trying to suggest that Tinma should not kill Johan not maybe not because he's not a criminal because he's not the killer maybe or maybe it's suggesting that timma you don't know everything about johan's situation yet you shouldn't kill him till you find all of that out but johan's trying to guard his past and erase it so how does that work but there, there's so many different parallels in this one story to all the scenarios going on right now in the main story that it's fascinating he says he simply carried out his orders but then, regardless of, regardless of who the story relates to, whether it's relating to Schubert and Carl and Johan, or Tinma and Johan, or Richard and Stephen, regardless of who it's relating to, the point is that once he killed him, once he killed the man, the birds wouldn't come to him anymore. And I just love that animation of, of Tinma's eyebrows shaking, like trembling, because he knows the resonance and the weight of what this man is telling him that it's about him being a murderer and he says ever since then the birds have never ridden on his shoulders ever again that they wouldn't come to him he says for over 60 years he's been apologizing i'm sorry i'm sorry he said but the birds never came back And God, it's so relatable, right? It's so relatable. He's like, once you kill, there is no going back. Even if you spend 60 years never doing it again, you'll never get that innocence back once it's gone. It's never going to be there for you. And it's just like, oh my God. Because, you know, yeah, like I've, I've said in a previous reaction, like my grandfather, he served in World War II and he was in the Navy. And when he came back from the Navy, it almost felt... Like he became a preacher, he became a postman, he never touched a gun again. And it almost felt like he was trying to like atone for whatever he had done during that time. But it's like, yeah, that, that innocence never fully comes back. And it's like, oh, it's just, it's powerful. And what's so powerful in this moment is that the bird, the man freaks out because the bird lands on Timma's arm. Showing that Timma still has that innocence in him. It's still there. It's not fully gone. Like, Tim is not far gone. He doesn't have to become a murderer. He doesn't have to get to the point where the birds won't be with him anymore. He's still got that innocence in him. He, it's not left him yet. And it makes me so frustrated because I'm like, Tinma, as much as I don't like Johan, as evil as I think Johan is, I don't want Tinma to kill him. 
because I don't want Timo to lose that innocence. I don't want him to make Dieter cry. And the man like reaches for the bird. He says, never again will blood flow through this forest. Isn't that right? And he looks, God, he looks at the bird, right? And Timma, Timma's face being so forlorn. Like, you just know Timma's like, God, I can't kill him here. Not after what this old man has said. That's not going to work. No. It's just, ugh. Oh. And that's it. And that's the forest. Yeah, so I don't think Tim is going to be killing anybody in the forest. I think I think that's the sanctuary. We can't do it. Plus the old man. The old man. But the thing is, the old man's a witness. So that's not going to work. I mean, the thing is, the old man is a witness now. So if they confront him, he's seen Tim with the scope, right? So I don't think Tim is going to kill him in the forest. And I don't think Tim is going to kill him in front of those kids either. I don't think that's going to happen. So the question is, what is he going to do? And we don't know. <laughs> We don't know, so, ah, but, oh my God, I, I feel like we needed a little bit of a breather after all these crazy episodes, but on the other hand, I'm like, I, what are we going to do, y'all? What are we going to do? I, I still think Tim is going to believe that he has to kill Johan, but I don't want him to. I, I want Johan brought to justice. I want Johan to be captured and I want the truth to come out about him but I don't want Timma to kill him and that's just what do we do then so I'm hoping I'm afraid that that Johan I'm afraid Johan knows that Timma's there and he knows what Timma's up to and he's going to try to lure Timma to a very convenient place where he could be easily spotted and make a lot of trouble for Timma but I'm hoping that Nina catches up with Timma and does her best to try to help him not get caught and get out of that. So the fact that Nina is there in Munich, to me, is a good thing. Because I feel like she could help Timma not get caught and not, maybe not pull the trigger. But I don't know. And what is Johan going to do when he finds out Nina's there? I it's All the forces are coming together. Like Dieter's there with Reichwein. And then you have Lunge coming with the police. Nina's there, Tim is there, Johan's there. It's it's all gonna it's all gonna come to a head at some point. And I'm not ready for that. But please no spoilers, hints or clues. But I'm really excited to know your thoughts down below. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this reaction and discussion. I'm really excited for next week, so we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But in the meantime, I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe, take care, and yeah. I'll be back very soon with more Monster. Bye.